Welcome to part two of House of Stone. The name of the spot where we're standing right now is the Garden of Eden. I'm not sure that that's exactly what the Garden of Eden looked like, but it had to have some kind of a catchy name, and that sounds pretty good to me. I just can't get over all the tiny little pinnacles here and the balanced rock. That's totally incredible. It's now getting late in the day and we have to start thinking about finding a place to camp. We can't camp in Arches National Park. There's just no place to camp. Some said there were places down along the Colorado River where you could camp. So we went down there and tried to find something, but we didn't find anything. I guess we hadn't done our homework. So we ended up just spending the night in our canopy in a rest stop, and that just wasn't all that bad, except the next morning I had a little trouble getting Marge out of bed. As we move south and east, we find more arches. Some of them are really quite huge, and each one of them is awe-inspiring. We take note of several of these arches as we go along. Then we come to a place that's called Dove Creek, and it's a place where they clean, bag, and even sell anasazi beans. You can buy them in any size bag you want, up to 100 pounds, and they're incredible. They're the original bean that they grew on these high altitudes. They grow good at about 10,000 feet without irrigation, and they were grown by the Anasazi Indians. They're the original bean, and they're from America. They're ancient villages every place you look and so we found another we walk down a dirt road a ways and find them over the edge of a hill and these indians were mostly farmers they grew a lot of beans corn and squash from here they were introduced to the entire world i don't know what they ate before the explorers came to the Americas and got seeds of these very wonderful vegetables that were grown by the Anasazi. Their stonework was totally incredible. And so we're going to go on down here after Marge gets done sniffing some of the really fragrant bushes that are in bloom and look at some of their building projects from a way back when. At first glance, it's almost breathtaking to see these ruins. Marge will go down first and I'll follow bringing the camera. And wow, what stonework they must have done here. And they're still standing to this day. And some of these ruins are thought to be 10,000 years old. The name of this site is Painted Hand. And it's just one out of many, many sites that we found down in the Four Corners area. These people were farmers, so they had plenty of time for culture of building these permanent homes. They didn't have to be constantly on the move like the Plains Indians. They'd stay here for generations. And wow, look at the stonework they did with all the native materials that are at hand. These people weren't only master stonemasons and builders, that everything in these places had a purpose. They were rather small people, so their short openings on the doors and 
the windows are placed in in a certain order so they can look out and see the star patterns and the sun patterns. And when they're just right, then it's time for planting their crops. Modern science through tree ring dating have decided that there was a severe drought here about 700 years ago. So all these people had to move out and find a different life someplace else. But these people are still around to this day. They've just moved farther south. Abandoning their structures, but they've stood the test of time right well for 700 years since man has been here and taken care of it until recently when the national parks got involved. They're sort of preserving these sites. A lot of these buildings were storage for their crops, like for their squash, and beans, and corn, and other things they grew. They grew a crop that we call just a pigweed or greens. That's really good engineering. I guess you don't have to worry about the roof leaking in a spot like this. The roof is solid stone and over a hundred foot thick. But there was even time to make a few pectoglyphs in these sites. Mother Nature was used to the maximum. There were, uh, like a sheltered spot under a rock would be a nice dry spot to build a grain bin, and then up on top of the very same rock would be a nice foundation to build another structure above it. The prickly pear cactus still grows and blooms here in the shadow of these great houses that were built here so long ago. I'm not certain where these people got their water for their villages, but these crops were mostly drought-resistant crops they grew and didn't need irrigation. The only thing they'd need would be a seep spring, spring would be plenty good to pr produce water for their village site. We now will go to Harvin Wheat Castle, and there's a long walk you can take around the perimeter of this canyon where they built all their houses. And these people only lived here about 200 years, from 900 uh Years ago, from 700 to 900 years was the 200 years that, that they lived here. And so they built considerable things at that period of time. And you'll notice the slots in some of the castles ahead. And they were pointed at a star or constellation. And when they lined up just perfect, it was time to start planting, or harvesting. And like all these ruins, they've withstood the test of time for all these years. A ring-neck lizard lays sunning himself on one of the rocks. He'd have probably made a pretty good meal all those years ago when this place was inhabited. The people that inhabited these places were farmers, but they did some hunting too. 
and probably they wouldn't have mind having a nice fat lizard for dinner. And they did hunt ground squirrels. That served two purpose. It kept the pesky critters from eating their crops and produced a lot of good protein for them. We looked at several of these, of the ruins of several of these buildings, and they were getting pretty sophisticated by this time. They learned how to build and build good and make them so they lasted the test of time. Some of the stones have fallen down from their walls, but the biggest, a lot of them are still intact. And of course, in the protected areas, they're much better off. But they learned how to build and build right using only the native stones and clay for mortar. Some of the structures are massive beyond belief, but in pre-Columbian periods of time, there were a lot of people here, so it must have taken a lot of people to do all that work to build this, and everything had a purpose. These little slots in the wall all had a purpose, probably for studying the stars and the sun. There are totally millions of stones that have been stacked very meticulous here with mud for with clay for mortar. And it's totally amazing how these people could do it without the use of animals nor the wheel. Just millions and millions of stones and without very much in the way of metal tools. We see some of the wild flowers still in bloom as we wander back toward our pickup where we're going to go on in a little. There's so many houses of stone built here and good trails to go around and see them all. It's, if you're interested in that, this is the place to go. It's just unbelievable. In any direction, there's some of it. And we see some sheep that may be still owned by the Native Americans that once settled there. And now we're heading for Colorado. And how could you go to Colorado without stopping at Mesa Verde? It's the only park in the entire United States park system that has that's dedicated strictly to the works of man. There's uh, tours you can go through, and one of the tours we're going on, you have to crawl through 
this little plywood uh, structure here. And if you can't get through there, then you can't go on the tour because that's the size of some of the openings. And the rangers tell me that they have had people that have got stuck in those plywood things, but they just take them apart and get them out. So we meet our tour guide and we're ready to go. Everyone is excited now as our ranger appears and introduces himself. We're going on a, one of the nicest tours there is here. It's called Balcony House. And so we'll go down and actually go through the, the actual building, buildings that they had and see all their grain bins and living quarters, which are still here under the cliff, in a protected area under the cliff. And he'll do an excellent job telling us about the things here at Balcony. On top of the mesas and outside the Mesa Verde, or Mesa Verde region. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be getting inside this village. This is different. Has anybody been here before? No one? Oh, good. Yeah, you have? You came back for seconds? Yeah. <laughs> How long ago, may I ask? 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be great, you guys. Um, now let's talk about logistics. We have to climb a 32-foot ladder, okay? Just be aware of that. Did you all see that photograph of the museum? Some folks don't like that, so just be aware of that. We're going to be, I'll drop the chain here. And I'll collect tickets. It's my real job. Turn professional, don't try this at home, all right? <laughs> we'll walk on down the path and keep your eyes open down this path. You always see some interesting things. There's different um, flowers blooming, there's this different cactus blooming, and this is where we've been spotting the, the blue-collared lizard. I don't know if you've ever seen those before. They're extraordinary. We've seen them on this path here, so we'll ask for collect tickets right here at the chain there, and just go ahead and walk down the path, all right? And then hang tight at the top of the stairs, Everybody goes through, I'll close the, the gate behind me or the chain behind me, and then um, I'll catch up with you guys. We're going to walk down about 100 feet, okay, using stairs. Take your time. Uh, part way down the stairs, I'm going to unlock the gate. See those keys come in handy. And then as you pass on through, take your time. You're going down more stairs. When everybody goes through, I'll <coughs> lock the gate behind me. You'll hear it. <laughs> and there you go. Take your time, you walk on a paved trail. You taller folks watch out for the headbangers on the trail. If you've never experienced those, you'll find out why they're called that. Interesting formation of sandstone. And then you're gonna walk on down to where that ladder is, we're gonna hang tight. We have to climb this ladder to get inside the village, and that's key. We will be inside this village. We'll climb this ladder, get inside, take a look around, go to the back side, get around these open pit structures. Now we are on the side of the canyon cliff, all right, so we're going to be really careful where we're walking. These open pit structures called kivas. Have you all got a taste or flavor of kivas? Mm -hmm. This is new to anybody. Don't be shy. If it's, is it new to anybody? Good. Not a problem. We will talk about this. Kivas are probably the, the most um, accurate cultural signature of who these people were and more importantly who they are today we'll talk about those you guys that have seen kivas take a look at these things a little bit different and then eventually to egress out of here we'll have to drop down on hand migration out of here they built within this crack in the sandstone formation they built this chambered room with two doorways the first door is about three feet long about a meter long about a meter high and about so why? Hey, did you all see that box we got up at the, at the visitor center? Yeah. <laughs> that virtual tunnel box. It's a good idea, I'm saying. <laughs> People actually got plugged in there before. <laughs> you could actually stand up inside this chamber room, eh? And then you'll have to drop down and crawl through a similar doorway on the south end, all right? You know, guys with the shoulders and stuff, you'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, once you get through that doorway, then the workout's going to commence. It's about 65, 70 foot as far as a climb goes to get to the top of the mesa. It'll be about a 15 foot ladder. There's a series of steps cut out 
Um, back in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps, there's a chain link railing, you know, as you go up those steps. No such thing as OSHA in them their days. <laughs> and then there's another 15 foot ladder on top of that. Take your time. Let's not get in a hurry. But I should ask, does anybody have a Cliff Palace tour lined up for 1030? Okay. We'll wash our time a little bit. So um, when we get out the top last ladder, we're going to pop back out. This is for all of us as well. Very, the very south end of the parking lot down there. It's going to take you about five minutes from your vehicle to drive over to Cliff Palace. So we'll wash our time. We'll be all right, though. Okay, Folks, I like to let you know how I like to do things. Easy. I like to mosey. We're not going to take Balcony House by siege. We'll save that for Memorial Day weekend. All right? We'll mosey through, take your time, get that last ladder, and the rest of the day is yours. That's the logistics. Any questions or comments? Shall I repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> well, not in the sun. Hey, well, we'll be in the sun. Okay, hope you have the sunblock on. Balcony House faces east. Those are the plot of mountains right over there off to the northeast of us. If you're heading towards Durango, that's the direction we'll be heading. Think about these guys living in an alcove side or a village that faces east, especially come January. We'll look around and see what's going on. You guys ready to go? How do you do? Hey! <laughs> How you doing, sir? Good. Now be careful walking down those steps with that camera. Yeah. Sometimes you get a good shot of like before you hit the dirt. Oh yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> These guys were staying in this area called Mesa Verde for 700 years, starting around 550-600 A.D. What you're about to witness is the end of time for these people. The last uh, cutting date, and I'll talk about dental chronology. Cutting dates like 12, 1280, 1281 in here. I think it's one of the last occupied sites at Mesa Verde. But visualize the landscape. 700 years of perpetual occupation, you know. Cutting down timbers for construction, for fire. The pottery kilns, in case you're interested about pottery kilns, were found up on tops of the mesas, side drafts catching that updraft, superheat that those ceramics. You'll see the materials used to make ceramics down here. Everything here was used. Nothing went to waste. For 700 years, perpetual occupation, most of these trees were gone. I told you. That's food. That's food. The flower is going to turn into a fruit that's edible. The prickly pear pad is also edible. You have to roast those things. <laughs> There you go. Use the handrails, always a good idea, huh? All right. That was your daily view. How would you observe life through those doors and those windows? What do I look like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You'll see, you know, the hand and toe holes. This one, this one here, I don't. I, me and my colleagues argue this because you see a lot of natural phenomena happening here as well. Right. But um, the ones that south of us, you can see in the morning because you can see the depression and the shadow. Now they are. Uh, we have our share of mountain lion and bobcat population here. I always come here and the first thing I want to look for tracks, and unfortunately all I see is Nike and Reeboks and stuff, you know. <laughs> Not too likely the mountain lion was wearing them. No yeah, doubt. You see them very often? It is back here. You're going to hear this term. It's called a seep spring. That is the source of life in here. The nearest flowing water course is about, like I said, seven miles south of us. But the secrets of this land is you have all this different species of wildlife that you can hunt, you can use, different species of plant life that you can gather, you can eat, you can boil down. Oh, pottery. Without pottery, man, these guys would not have advanced like they did, were able to. They would take different kinds of vegetation, boil them in pots, you know, and they would eat them greens. <laughs> Amaranth. Oh, boy. It's good stuff. Tastes like wild spinach. They cultivate it. They call it pigweed locally. It grows everywhere. Quite prolific. And boy, yeah, don't eat too much. But you're looking at, you know, the alcoves right here being formed by the major secret in this land is water that's trapped between the sandstone and the shell deposit. 
This is where you gather your clay materials. This is what you need to crush with your, along with sand and, and add your water and, and the secret ingredients of making these ceramic pots. These rooms had pottery in there at one time. They had ceramics in there at one time. Storage vessels, storing your water, collecting your water, storing uh, ceramic dippers, water dippers, dipping water, putting in your pots and stuff. But the best thing of all about this is, you know, you have a very active source of water all close to your residence. Mm. This soup spring came close to drying up last summer. I'm pleased to say it's starting to recharge again. We're going through a 70 year period of drought. If things don't change, we're going to end up like these guys, more than likely. <laughs> you got to visualize, you know, we know this. This is the end of time right here. We'll talk about it, you know, it's tree ring dating. Um, times were getting very, very tough, and there's this issue of a drought that persisted for 23 years in a row, not to mention colder climate. That's tough for people growing up on top of the mesas, faith farming your corn, your beans, and squash, and anything that you can try to eat. And when those things don't occur in that cycle, the world is out of balance, things become out of balance, people pack up what they can carry, left most of their belongings behind, and moved out of here. What we're about to do is go up this ladder and get inside this village. Now, folks, this is something I really got to make clear. Every one of us is responsible for the preservation and caretaking of this site. Please consider yourself as stewards of Balcony House. Most of what you're looking at is the original construction. We'll be climbing this ladder, we'll get inside the village. I would like to invite you, this is your only opportunity to see for yourself the authentic roof construction. The timber that was cut and split with stone tools laid up to separate two-story rooms. Okay? You're know, welcome to stick your head inside the doorways. Please, however, don't go inside those rooms. Take a look, see it for yourself. Um, it's just a matter of avoiding any physical contact. That's the main thing. Okay? And then, what I really want to stress is the fact that um, well, let's put it this way. How do you think some of the indigenous people feel about us being here? Something to think about. Some folks don't like it one bit. These people and their viewpoint are still here. We are going into their houses. We are just guests. We are just visitors. On the other hand, there are those people out there and they are trying to, they are representing and they're basically just telling us that if we can treat these places with respect, then we as visitors into these households can leave with a better understanding and hopefully a better appreciation. Okay. So when we get inside, that's all we need to do is keep that in mind. Is respect. We are going into some, somebody's house. Okay? You know, ready to get up there? Knocking, <laughs> but nothing's going to happen. It's, it's securely anchored down. This is a trip, you guys. We are going into the back of the house and working our way towards the front. When you chew up, look up here, you'll see the remnant of what used to be a wall <coughs> continued all the way across this side of the alcove. We are going in a route that was not employed by these people. When we get up these ladders, take your time. There's a narrow area up there. And for those who have backpacks with them, it's best to take your backpack off once you get to the top and then hand carry it. All sides with you. There's one, you got the other. Get that death grip on it, and you're in. Hey, yeah, hey, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Now you be careful. He's worth the toss of people. 
Yeah, I see that. They were just dropped right away. Oh, what, what's in here? Here we are at the Denise now. We are here Denise room with that original balcony minus the concrete and building wire. That's an original thing. That one's so nice. And you guys have been to Cliff Palace, and if you're planning on going there, be aware of this. Cliff Palace has 150 rooms, 23 keys. We'll talk about these. This place has 35 rooms and two keys. There was more original timber in this small site than Cliff Palace and Spruce Tree House combined. What happened to all that wood? So we take all this timber right in here. We start extrapolating dates. This, the study of tree ring, dating, gendrochronology. You all familiar with that terminology? It's pretty clever. You can look at trees. You can tell how old they are by counting the annual growth rates. Someone got this great idea of like, wait a second. What if we went through the southwest and extracted in cuts or core samples from these pre-Columbian posts and timbers and, um, and, and, and bump these tree rings against old growth forest tree rings? You'll see the same pattern in there. You can build a bridge in time. So you got a 600-year-old tree, a 200-year-old tree. You'll see the same pattern in the 200-year-old tree in the 600-year-old tree. There was a building of a bridge extending back in time several thousand years. You see all these timbers, there's cores in there. A nice pile of wood in the back. We've taken end cuts and core samples out. We can tell you with this tree database the year the tree was cut down. That's as close as you're going to get to date in these sites. 1200s, just like the other sites. In these rooms, all that you've got to just look up is the original rooftop construction. Now you know how they did it. It's quite clever. There's a balcony over here, there's a balcony here, a balcony there, here's the name. Balcony yes. house. <laughs> Has anybody ever hit their head on that balcony yet this yes. morning? Yes. Oh, okay. How <laughs> tall is it? Hey, you're just <laughs> like that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have you got next to it? Okay, you should be sad. I'll cue you. I'll cue you. And then you have this nice spacing ball with the mortar. You see a few chinking stones, and then you can see that they didn't do flat These would look like, to me, ideal living rooms, except there's something in those rooms that probably ought to be there for living rooms, especially come October, November, December, January, February.